Are you ready for more? Yes. Yeah? Okay, you are very brave. I'm very impressed. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the next uh, simile here. Uh, so suppose a person carrying a blazing grass torch uh, was to walk against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that person doesn't quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, uh, wouldn't they burn their hands or arm or other limb? Uh, resulting in death or death-like suffering for them. Yeah? It's a bad idea to have a blazing grass torch and walk against the wind. It kind of causes problems. And uh, if you do that, you end up dying, or maybe you burn up or something happens to you. So what is the idea here? Why is the Buddha comparing the five sense world to a blazing grass torch? What does that mean? And uh, a blazing grass torch, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, you grab it, you hold on to it, uh, and then uh, you use it, yeah, because there's certain light coming off it, so it has a certain benefit. Uh, the benefit comes first, and then when you, uh, then afterwards, when the wind uh, kind of hits you and you burn up, that's when the downside comes of the blazing grass torch. Yeah, some benefit you see a little bit, then the downside becomes very quickly visible. Uh. And it's the same thing with the idea of sensual pleasures. Yeah. The immediate benefit of sensual pleasures is that you enjoy. Yeah, you have a nice meal, you have a nice relationship, you enjoy the world in a certain way. Yeah. But of course, once you enjoy things, uh, you're also attached to things. Uh, yeah, because that's kind of the nature of enjoyment. Enjoyment leads to attachment. Uh, that's kind of part for the course in a sense. Uh, and the moment you attach to things in the five sense world, uh, at that moment uh, you're asking for suffering. Uh, yeah, because attachment will always be challenged by nature. Yeah. Whatever attachment you have to whether it's people or things that you own or whatever it is to your status or whatever it is, uh, that attachment will always let you down because the nature is always there to challenge those attachments, uh, to destroy whatever has been built up, uh, yeah, to, uh, to make people die, to make, uh, to make houses burn down, to kind of losing your job or losing your money and wealth and all of these kind of things. Uh, that's what nature does to you. Uh, so uh, this is this idea of the blazing grass torch. Sensual pleasures, uh, there's a little bit of joy there straight away because this is what the grass torch does. Uh, but attachment always leads uh, to suffering down the track. Yeah. So every time you attach, you are say, saying, please, may I suffer. Uh, that's what you are saying. Yeah. So remember that, yeah? Holding on, grasping on to things. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh. So um, this, I think, is the idea behind this one. This one is not as obvious what is going on. Uh. This is my interpretation of this particular simile of the blazing grass torch. Uh. Yes, sir, says the householder uh, happily. Now we come to the next simile. So this next simile is very challenging. Uh. And I will explain it to you, but it's kind of really hard to grasp sometimes. And remember again, the idea of the Buddha's teaching is that it is supposed to be a little bit challenging. If it wasn't challenging, it wouldn't be interesting yet. So this is kind of part, again, to be expected sometimes. So this is the next simile. Suppose there was a pit of glowing coals deeper than a man's height full of glowing coals that neither flamed nor smoked. Then a person would come along who wanted to live and who doesn't want to die, who wants to be happy and recoils from pain. Then two strong men would grab that person by the arms, drag them toward the charcoal, the pit of glowing coals. What do you think, householder? Wouldn't that person writhe and struggle to and fro? Yes, sir. Why is that? For that person knows if I fall into that pit of glowing coals, that would result in my death or death-like suffering. Yeah? So, um, the five sense world is like a charcoal pit. Yeah? And if you fall, happen to fall into that five sense world, uh, you are going to burn like death like yeah, or have death like suffering as a consequence. Uh, does that even make remotely sense to anyone? Uh, so I will <laughs> I'll try to explain to you what is going on because it's very hard to understand this. How can the five sense world be like a charcoal pit? Yeah? All of these beautiful things that we have in the world, yeah, nice cups of coffee. 
nicely juices, yeah, kind of nice relationships, sort of enjoying our entertainment in the world. How can it be like a charcoal pit? And to understand this, what you have to do is you have to go to another sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Magandhya Sutta, which actually explains this simile. It explains exactly what is going on here. And according to that Magandhya Sutta, there is this wanderer, a wanderer called Magandhya. He goes to the Buddha, has a conversation with the Buddha. And uh, during this conversation, uh, the Buddha tries to explain Magandhya exactly this particular point. Uh, and the point that the Buddha makes to Magandhya says, suppose there is a leper. Uh, you know lepers, yeah, leprosy, yeah, kind of this very itchy, very difficult disease that people get. These days, not so many lepers left. There are apparently there's still a few in India, but not many around the world. Uh, so suppose there is a leper, and a leper, because of the itchiness of the wounds on their hands, yeah, it's kind of very itchy, and often there would be maybe like worms and things in the wounds, and it's a really terrible illness. And they will go to a charcoal pit, just like we are seeing here, and they will kind of burn their hands, burn their feet, burn their limbs over that charcoal pit. Why? Because that gives a degree of satisfaction, because the itching is so bad, that when you burn it, it actually feels better. Yeah? And then the Buddha says, well, then that leper goes and burns the charcoal pit. But later on, that leper goes back to the family. And when they go back to the family, the family says, we will find a doctor for you. He will treat your leprosy. They take him to the doctor. The doctor treats the leprosy. And then the Buddha says to Magandhya, well, now, after he has been treated, after the leper is free from leprosy, will he still go to that charcoal pit and burn his arms or hands there? And Magandhya said, of course not, yeah, no way he will go there. And then the Buddha makes the point, yeah, is it only now that that charcoal pit is painful and suffering, you don't want to burn yourself, or was it also painful and suffering before? It was always painful and suffering. So why did that person burn his limbs beforehand? And the reason was because his faculties were distorted. You weren't able to see clearly what is going on. You are so distorted that that which appears, that what actually is painful, appears to be happy. Yeah, that's the point. So you burn your hands on the charcoal pit because what is painful appears as happiness. And the Buddha says that is the five sense world. Because of the distortion of perception, because our, la our lack of perspective, understanding what is going on, that which is painful actually appears as happiness. It's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? Very difficult to understand. And the only way you can really understand this, again, is by the practice on the path, coming out of this whole thing that we call the five sense well, understanding it from above, entering a state of samadhi, climbing that mountain where the mind is really lifted up above everything else. And then you can understand why this actually may be true. And uh, the way I like to think of this, to make sense of it, uh, let me just kind of adjust the microphone. The microphone is going further and further away, so probably after a while, I can't hear anything. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the ways I like to understand this uh, uh, is to understand that the problem is actually the craving, yeah? because craving is a very painful thing. Yeah? The Buddha often talks about craving as like being a fire or a flame in the mind. Yeah? You are uh, ablaze with craving and ill will and delusion, and this is kind of the problem in life. Uh, and a way to think about that is like cigarette smoking. Yeah? Are any, any of you here ever smoked cigarettes? Uh, you don't, don't have to raise your hand if you are embarrassed about it or whatever. Yeah? <laughs> But uh, I, I remember when I was kind of young, I kind of occasionally would, just, I would smoke a cigarette. I never smoked regularly. So it was always painful whenever I smoked. Like, oh, oh, oh it was absolutely awful. Huh? So I just smoked these big cigars, yeah, because you're kind of messing around and just kind of being, being silly. Yeah? Going go to university. And I, when I was at university back in the 1980s, uh, then the university life was really crazy. I think these days, people and students are supposed to be serious. In my days, students were not serious at all. They were just partying and having a good time. Anyway, that those <laughs> I mean, that's why I became a monk, because I realized how, how silly it was. Eh? But um, so you, you smoke these cigarettes, and it's actually awful. Yeah, you cough, and it's just terrible. And you do just do it because you're, kind of, you're hanging out and trying to be cool or whatever it is. Eh? And so you do this kind of thing. But actually, it's terrible. Eh? But then after a while, you get used to the idea of smoking. You get addicted to the nicotine. Eh? 
So you have to smoke, yeah? And what drives you to smoking is that craving for the nicotine. The taste of the cigarette is just as bad as it was before, yeah? It's just as evil. But now that taste feels nice because the craving is so incredibly powerful to have a cigarette that that thing which actually is painful suddenly starts to feel nice. It is craving distorts the mind to make you feel something which actually is bad feels nice. And you can see that especially with cigarettes. Yeah? And so the idea here is that some of those really powerful cravings we have as human beings, they are of a similar kind. Yeah? A similar kind. What appears uh, to to us, uh, what actually is suffering, appears to us as happiness. Why? Because we are overcoming a very powerful craving, a very powerful desire. Uh, and so this is kind of the interesting thing. Uh, and uh, I think the main kind of thing that this is talking about here is probably sexuality. Yeah, this kind of the main thing, uh, which can be a very strong craving, uh, and then that craving itself, uh, overcoming the craving is the main aspect here of what actually is called pleasure. Uh, but the craving itself is painful. Uh. So that gives you an idea, maybe, of what is going on with a charcoal pit. Uh, yeah? so it's kind of, uh, uh, it's hard to maybe grasp, uh, but the better your meditation is, uh, the more understanding you will have of these kind of similes. Uh. Let us move on now. I'm very happy no one has still, no one has left the room. Actually, wait, Sean, you're about to leave the room, is that right? Uh, you had enough? Yeah? <laughs> you're supposed to ordain as a monk, you can't leave the room. Yeah, it's, 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 it's. Let's go on to the next simile here. Yeah. So that was the, that is the most hardcore simile we just had a look at. The rest are actually much easier to deal with, so uh, that's good news, uh, I presume. Uh, so now we come to the simile of the dream that we talked about yesterday very briefly. Suppose a person was to see delightful parks, woods, meadows and lotus ponds in a dream. But when they woke up they couldn't see them at all. Yeah? That is the, um, the simile, very short and very brief. So um, this I, this is the idea, yeah? The idea here is the uh, idea of the five sense world. Uh, we have this um, idea of where the five sense world is going to get us. Uh, the things, the kind of delight it is going to be. Uh, yeah, how we dream about new things, we dream about having a new house, a new car, whatever. We dream about a new relationship, uh, or whatever it might be. Uh, and very, almost always, uh, things don't turn out the way that they want them to turn out. It's always a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, it never is like the dream. The dream things are perfect. Uh, in reality, they're very different. Uh, this is the delusion of that five sense world, yeah? Not actually living up to its reality, yeah? yeah? And I always kind of, I just like to take myself as an example because I always had these ideas as well when I was young about what kind of life I was going to have, yeah? I was going to have this kind of job, I was going to have that kind of girlfriend, I was going to have this kind of car and house, I was going to be very successful of course, because when you're young you, you're very conceited, you think that you're going to be <laughs> have all these kind of things, uh, yeah. And then you end up as a monk, yeah, which is kind of uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the things are never the way you expect it. Uh. But, even, uh, but even then, you know, I, you know the, the kind of reality of all of those things, sometimes you get some of those things uh, and they never live up to the billing. Yeah. They're never as good as you think, yeah? Real life is often very kind of um, mundane and boring and nothing really happens. Real life is like washing the dishes and going to work and changing the nappies. That's what real life is like, right? Real life is not like the romantic ideas that you have in your head. Real life is just really grey, yeah? And kind of uh, the best thing you can do is come into the BGF, yeah? That's kind of the... <laughs> the highlights of this life sometimes, when you get some real inspiration and really positive things. Uh, this is the idea, the dream and the reality. The reality never lives up to the dream. Uh, craving is a liar. Craving whispers in your ear that this will create satisfaction. This will bring out the beautiful meadows, uh, the beautiful mountain tops, and you will be on, on the, kind of the, in the seventh heaven, yeah? and you'll be so happy and joyful but with all these kind of sensual pleasures. Uh, Craving is a liar, and because craving is a liar, the dream is never true. Reality never lives up to the 
uh, thought or what you think is going to be there. Yeah, and then you die. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of you go along, you try to follow these kind of things, you try to uh, build up the reality and you try to make these dreams real and, and nothing really works. And then you die and you wonder again, you wonder what was this all about? What was the purpose of this life? Uh, and so it's good to be realistic about these things soon. Because the sooner you are realistic about what is going on, the sooner you can do something about it. Yeah, you can change your direction a little bit. One of the things that I often forget to say is, what, what does it mean to change direction exactly? And you perhaps you think that it means that I'm saying you should become a monk or a nun, but that is not really what I'm saying. Because sometimes I know that is impossible for many people. You can't do that for a variety of reasons. So that is not really what I mean. What I mean is just that you start to think about life in a new way. Yeah? Instead of pursuing things, pursuing things in the world that are empty. Yeah? Things that you have to give up anyway when you die. Yeah? What's the point of pursuing things that you have to give up? And then you are kind of standing on, you know, uh, you are kind of bare, you have nothing left after you die. You carry on into the future. It's like investing for the very short term, right? Why invest for the short term when actually what we're looking at is far more important, carries on indefinitely into the future. We should invest for the long term. And that's really what this means. And investing for the long term doesn't mean necessarily to become more a monk or nun. It means that the way we deal with life on an everyday basis is different. And we start to understand the urgency of living well, the urgency of being kind, the urgency of being compassionate, all of these kind of things. That is actually what it means. And so your daily life becomes different. You treat people in a different way. Yeah, your family members, your work colleagues, the people here at BGF, whatever it is. And you think about life in a new way. And that is what this really means. And the more powerful this message is, the more you understand what is going on, the more ability you have to make these things happen in your daily life. Yeah? You can actually start to make these things really work for you. Right? This is what all of this means. Uh, and so it's important to kind of get these things right. Otherwise, we, uh, uh, you, know, you, you kind of hear all this and nothing really happens later on. Uh, and your ability in the long run, also someone asked about this yesterday during the Dhamma talk, uh, your ability in the long run to kind of renew this and to carry on living well, doing the right thing, uh, depends on the kind of regular diet or dhamma. Yeah? That regular diet or dhamma will always remind you of what actually matters in life, what is really important, how to invest for the long term. Don't be a short-term investor. Yeah? Short-term investors, they always lose out. Be a long-term investor. Yeah? And uh, as I like to say, if you want to be a long-term investor, uh, don't go to the investment banks, yeah? don't go to Goldman Sachs, don't go to the bank around the corner. They don't know anything about long-term investment. Uh, Go to the Buddha. He understands long-term investment. Yeah, and this is fascinating. Yeah, because it, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, because the Buddha has a very different kind of horizon when it comes to investment. Uh, and it's not a 20-year horizon or a 40-year horizon or a lifetime horizon. It's a multi-lifetime horizon. And if you go down to the local bank and you say you want to invest for multi-lifetimes, uh, they're going to send you out the door straight away, and they're going to say you are nuts. Uh, go and see your psychiatrist. Uh, so the Buddha has a very different way of approaching these things. Uh, and so this is, this is why, again, the idea of right view is so important. Uh, because right view opens up the possibility of investing in the right way and not being short-term investors like everyone in this world actually is, uh, even though they claim to be long-term investors. Uh, with that thought, let's do some meditation. Okay, so uh, any uh, last questions before lunch? Lunch is coming up soon. Huh? Are you able to focus on the questions? Uh, <laughs> see what happens. Uh. Um, Ajahn, I wish to seek Ajahn's further clarifications on Exhibit 4 about the glowing cold speed <laughs> that you make reference to another sutta yeah. on the leprosy. Yeah, that, that's, that leprosy, I couldn't catch or connect the dots. So Okay, so I'll try again. I'll try Thank again. You. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the, the idea is that 
our mind is biased in the same way that the mind of a leper is biased. Yeah, so um, the mind, when you are immersed in sensual uh, desires and pleasures, it is very biased in the sa exactly the same way as the mind of a leper is biased. The leper is so biased uh, that the leper is willing to go to a fire and burn their hands in the fire because what actually is painful feels pleasant to them. Yeah? Fire is actually painful, but to them it feels pleasant because of the suffering of leprosy, because of the itch, because of the worms, all those, those kind of things. Uh, in the same way, our mind is so biased when you're in the middle of the sensual world uh, that even though the sensual pleasures to us they seem pleasant, actually they are painful once you withdraw from that world. Uh, once the leper becomes healed, uh, he no longer goes near the fire. Once you become healed from sensual pleasures, <laughs> What does that mean to be healed of a sensual body? It means that you attain samadhi. Once you attain the state of samadhi, you are healed. You understand what it is? Then the dukkha, you understand the dukkha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. Eh? But yeah, sorry for going a bit too fast, maybe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Any last questions before lunch, or uh, are you mindfully focused on lunch now, huh? or is it clear? <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> Burning coal in the coffee. Burning <laughs> coal in the coffee, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let's just take, let maybe break off there then, and then we can always, there's always lots of opportunities for questions later on, and we have a few minutes to kind of get ready for, for lunch. So we'll see you downstairs soon. Great.